I love food and I love food that I can feel is nourishing me and I love making food for the people that I hold close to me and knowing that I'm giving them nutrients and I'm loving them up by what I'm giving them on their plate and then I'm loving the planet and the community around me by where I choose to purchase and how I engage with our local food producers. That was Marie Lowe's and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott and in this podcast series I'll be uncovering the world of regenerative agriculture, its people, practices and principles and empowering you to apply their learnings and experience to your business and life. I'm an 8th generational Australian farmer who transitioned my family farm from industrial methods to holistic regenerative practices. Join me as I dive deep into the regenerative journeys of other farmers, chefs, health practitioners and anyone else who's up for a yarn and find out why and how they transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome to the show. Today I'm very excited to announce that Marie Lowe's is our guest. Um, I've been doing some work with Marie over the last sort of six months, um, met her a couple of years ago. Amazing, wonderful um, woman who has, well, you may, you may know her uh, from Dirt Girl. She is Dirt Girl on the ABC, that wonderful kids show that's been um, syndicated around the world and won a number of awards and, and quite rightly so. I caught up with Marie at uh, Jilamatong at Bungandore, a wonderful farm down there and uh, in New South Wales, uh, Braidwood I should say, and um, we talked about her work with Indigenous communities, um, uh, natural seconds farming which was being um, uh, a practice taking place at the farm where we were and uh, many many things and, and one of the most important things I took away was you know telling a better story and, and telling not just telling for example the indigenous stories better you know because we need to hear we don't lose that knowledge and that wisdom but telling our own stories a lot better and being honest with ourselves and being transparent and being authentic which is exactly what Marie is and I trust you enjoy this wonderful chat with Marie Lowe's. Marie Lowe's, welcome to the show. Thank you, Charlie Arnott. Can you, um, <laughs> <laughs> so formal, can we, <laughs> I don't know your second name though, so I'll just not go there, I've got 12. Um, I have one name like Madonna. Is it, is it like, um, I don't know, was it, what is it? Marie. Marie. <laughs> Oh, just the one. Oh, sorry. I thought you said it was your second name was like Madonna or something. <laughs> well, my second name is actually Charles, so that's what that's going to be confusing. Is it? I'm not going to tell you my first name. That's so interesting, but it's not Charlie Charles. Is no, it? it's Charles. Very formal. <laughs> okay. Now, what are we doing? We're here. Can you tell us where we are and what, what we've been doing for the last day and a half? Yeah, absolutely. So we're here at Jillamatong on the south coast of New South Wales here in Australia, and we've been hanging out on this property seeing really the beneficial outcomes of regenerative agriculture um, and how that's helping the people here um, improve the health of the soil and the health of the water, the health of the animals and their own health. And you can just feel it, you know, like this is so green compared to neighbouring pastures. It is so alive and you kind of just feel good being here. Like your cells relax. You just, yeah. It's a great vibe, isn't it? Yeah. And we had um, um, Peter Andrews here yesterday yeah. who was, sort of, I guess, the father of uh, Natural Seconds Farming, which is yeah. what Martin Roy is the owner of Jillamatong. And we're looking down on some of it just, just below us here and the, the willows in the creek and the floodplain. Um, and, and Peter's been doing that for 40 years. And it's really been the last 10 that it's people are starting to understand the um, – the effectiveness of yeah. it, you know, and his ability to read the landscape um, and work out what it used to do and its function, yeah. you know, all those hundreds of years ago before we came along. It's interesting really because I think at the moment um, a lot of people are looking for how we can write a better story for the future mm. and there are people um, like Peter, like Martin, uh, who've been – doing this for a long time and talking about this for a long time and it's only now that people are starting to really listen and we're actually looking at practices that were used years ago mm. and now that's how we can write a better story for the future it, not everything is you know not everything new is necessarily good or, and and it's a great lesson in you know 
um, reading the literally the diaries of the first explorers and the pioneers and and understanding how they what they saw. Yeah. Now that's never for me. My view is not going to be our benchmark to get back to because I think we're sort of we've changed it so much. But as Peter Andrews says, you know, if we, we've scarred the landscape so much that we yeah. need to use every tool we have, every like the a, a gully in a in a floodplain is a is a wound, and we need the sutures of different trees to to pull it together. So. And those trees aren't necessarily going to be native trees, which is a whole other conversation. And that was so powerful yesterday when Matt was saying that he, you know, it was interesting hearing him talk about those diaries of some of those first settlers mm. and, and that terminology of it being a scar on that floodplain where we were standing and standing there with the, with the water crossing that they have, you know, innovated and developed mm. and hearing how that's helping um, heal that area, mm. but also what that means for the rest of the property and for water security, um, you know, when there's been a drought nearby and they've been able to retain water here for three years, totally. potentially up to eight. It's huge. It's like an absolute game changer. And you can see why other people are starting to tune into the good sense in that. Well, well um, Peter's son, um, Stuart, Tarwin Park Training, he's running courses all over Australia um, teaching people this, this stuff. You hear those magpies? Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. This just used to be like uh, six weeks ago. No, four weeks ago. This is brown. All that were here, and for those who can't see it, the, the garden was probably still green, but out where we see now is brown, except for the floodplain down there. Wow. Marie, um, I'm going to move that that way a little bit. Well, hopefully, just so we, people can see your beautiful face there, um, and probably cover my beard up. Um, <laughs> I'm used to hanging out with big beards. Yours is <laughs> not Costa. not quite as big as. <laughs> I'm in I'm in kindergarten compared to, <laughs> to Costa, Costa. Of that beard. Yeah. Man, that's a, that is a work of art, isn't it? <laughs> He's great. Tell me, um, uh, talking about nature, we, yeah. can, we can hear it there in the background still. Mm, um, how did you? Us. How did you? What was? What got you into nature? What what made it such an, uh, such a um, important part of your your life and your career? Mm, it's funny. I get asked that question a bit, and I don't really have a memory before it was part of my relationship with the world. So I grew up in the country. I grew up in um, the northern ri- rivers of New South Wales. Mm. So um, in Grafton and Yamba, it's Bundjalung country there. And we had paddocks to the horizon behind our back fence. We always had lots of snakes coming through our yard. We had lots of <laughs> pets. Um, and we would go and make mazes in the sugar cane out the back of our house. And we would have cow pat fights with the cow dung. And, <laughs> you know, like it was just... Totally. I mean, it's, it's a fun thing to do. But, yeah, that was part of what we did when we were little. And obviously when you're a teenager, you start to explore some different stuff. And that's when I got really into storytelling through um, performance and through playing music. Um, but... All that time I'd spent in the backyard and the backfields and on friends' farms and in the river, you know, that's just in my cells. And and even when I've travelled around the world, I find that I am attracted to places of nature that are, um, you know, that are ecosystems, that are, are whole and and I feel at ease when I'm in places of nature. Um Cities are exciting, but yeah, I love I love being out and I feel myself, as I said here, I feel myself relax mm. and kind mm. of kick back a gear. That green has certainly um, put a hole across the state where it's rained and certainly in, in, in the bushfire areas. And there were some fires just very close to here. We saw them yesterday, didn't we? The, the, the yeah. remnants of a, a pine forest that had, had been, been burnt um, and very close around um, Braidwood, where we are. Marie, um you you you've had an alter persona for the last ten years. Do you want to yeah. tell people about that? It's sure. it's cool. I want I want to hear all about it. Yes, yeah, so I've seen a lot of it. I just want to hear about <laughs> yeah. it now. So I've spent the last ten years um, hanging out in the world as Dirt Girl. So that is so cool. Yeah. It's been a wild ride. I'm a bit of a fanboy, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, I'm a fan of your work too. <laughs> oh, stop it. And can I just say, uh, my daughter Lila is such a fan. And can I just say that Marie. Um, just after we met, she sent a video, a little personal video to Lila, and I can't tell you what how special that was. 
Mm. I should have told that story later, but I had to tell you now. <laughs> no, no. No, no. She, we were, I was nearly in tears oh. now because it was such a beautiful thing. that You just so didn't have to do that and you had, you're a busy person and what's going on and you just took the time to do that. And it was it was beautiful. So thank you. You, mm. you made a um, little girl very and a dad very happy too. So That makes my heart happy too. So Well, yeah. you're making a lot of people happy. Now, I'm still I'm – st- Pulling the story now, you go. Come on. <laughs> it's fine, yeah. So Dirt Girl is the central character in um, what started out with the music and then we um, there was a TV show. So Kate McQuillan and Huey Eustace, they created a TV show. It was basically um, a way to share a love for the planet and instill that in um, the children that are growing up in this world now. And so Dirt Girl is the central character and she has her friend Scrap Boy and then later when we created the second show, Costa Ge- Georgiatis came on board as Costa the Garden Gnome. And um, the first series was an animation, part live action, part animation, and it's been screened in 128 countries around the world wow. and really celebrated for um, how it's um, – helped children connect with the world around them and you know we've always said that we protect what we love and recently I was doing a beach cleanup with Jack Johnson and we realized that we both use that phrase we we protect what we love um so and we've always done it through absolute joy through having fun so Dirt Girl has all these adventures in the world with her best friends um and she's an eco warrior and she writes songs. And so I've spent a lot of time in in her cells, basically. And then we created Get Grubby TV, which is um, we grew the permaculture garden. Huey used to screw it. And um, so we got to take Dirt Girl and Costa and a Scrap Boy into the real world. And from that, we have travelled all around Australia, um, hung out with traditional owners on their country, uh, spent a lot of time with farmers, people whose knowledges are based in this land and in the sea as well. And yeah, and got to really be part of a lot of communities and how they would like to write a better story for the future. Um, and so, yeah, so I've been doing that for 10 years mm. and I've got to go, you know, I was thinking back to late last year when I would be, there was a, a, a period where I was um, up in Cairns and then in Tassie and then from Tassie I went to Alice and was um, hanging out with the communities on Aranda country outside Alice and we were growing food in the desert you know it's just it's it really is a, a once in an opportunity way to way to live and way to connect so it's been pretty amazing. So what what are you taking into your new your next sort of project next chapter of your life that that you learnt or you you really because I've got your teeth into in those ten years being, mm. being dirt girl. What, what what are you what are you taking with you that's that you're going to use and use well and yeah you know, help help the planet. Yeah, well, yeah. So I finished up after a decade with that on the thirty um, first of December. So it's, did you have a party? <laughs> we did. I played at Woodford. We oh, um, wow. so dirt girl and her band Mother Earth played at Woodford. So we did that and we got to really spend some beautiful time together to. Um, sh- you know, celebrate what we've shared, and there were tears, and and Dirt Girl and Costa actually led the lantern parade around Woodford because they have these big lanterns of us. So that was really amazing, you know. And just it was really funny because we'd be walking along, and you'd hear little kids or or parents say, "Look at the Dirt Girl lantern," and then I'd walk up to them, and they'd go, <laughs> "Freak oh, them out! It's really Dirt Girl! It's really <laughs> Costa!" Um, it was hilarious, That's but so yeah, cool. it was an amazing way to wrap it up and. Um, hand it over to the next generation of Dirt Girl and Scrap Boy now who are spectacular human beings and have all the heart and knowledge and um, talent and everything they need to to step into those gumboots. But, yeah, what am I going to carry forward? Um, Well, the creator of Dirt Girl World, uh, Kate McQuillan, she operates by three pillars, connect, understand, act. And we have worked together for a long time Um, basing what we do with communities around that that you can have all the facts and information in the world but if people haven't connected with their hearts with what it is that we're trying to protect then uh, it's really hard to sustain any behavior change um, and to keep it going so yeah so definitely that connect understand act principle um, is really deeply instilled in me thanks Kate Um, and Man, so much. I've learnt so much from all the kids that I've hung out with. You know, 
when I first started to do meet and greets with with families, I'd talk to them about their garden and they'd want to tell me what they were growing and and you know we'd get photos together. But over time, what I realized is the power of looking into a little person's eyes, hearing them, feeling mm. their spirit and their joy and telling them, you are so amazing. Mm. You are so amazing. And if that's all I did with every kid that I met in the meet and greet or, you know, who I hung out with, with that day, I always felt like I'd done something good, like I'd shared, you know, something good with them. And and it was reciprocal because, you know, they were giving me so much. Um but yeah, and that isn't really, that doesn't seem like planet work. It doesn't seem directly tied into, you know, environmentalism or whatever. But I think we are all our most powerful selves when we stand in our truth. And so to get to hang out with people, little people who are at a really formative time in their life and have someone that they watch on TV and look up to them, look into their eyes and tell them how amazing they are. Um, yeah, that was incredible. And, you know, I want to do that with adults too. I want to hang out with adults, um, work with them to build resilience in communities and in themselves and, and just help people feel, um, like they can stand in their truth and be of use and yeah, hold space in the world. I think, you know, what you're saying about just, you know, telling kids that they're amazing and, you know, the, the, that's foundational work, you know, for children who are in the world of, you know, Steiner and we're, we're biodynamic farmers and so on. So we, we're, we're really focusing on and, and understand the importance of the sort of the, the seven year cycles that, that we all go through, have been through. And, you know, it's in that first seven where they're, they're becoming familiar with themselves and nature and their part in nature. So to, to sort of, for them to understand and be given, you know, essentially a bit of a pep talk about, you know, and just, just, Getting them to understand they are amazing, you know, and they yeah. are part of nature, and they are they are limitless in their in their yeah. in their opportunities. You know? And I kind of feel like we're as big and as small as you know the largest thing in the universe and the tiniest thing in the universe. It's not about hanging out in an egotistical space, you know. An awesome thing that I learned from Costa one of the first times I think we were doing some gardening with kids was um, we were planting um, seedlings in a garden bed and a little maybe seven or eight year old had not covered up the roots of the plant and rather than Costa going back and just fixing it up mm. or not even fixing it some people will be you know just hands off if they don't grow they don't grow but we always make sure that if we are doing a planting or growing things with people that when we leave they're really going to grow that the garden will be robust and resilient after we leave um, and so Costa rather than going back and covering it up himself he um, got the little boy to come over and said, you know, do you, do you how do you think this is going to go? Mm. Do you think it's going to grow? And then he talked through it and he didn't fix it himself. He got the little boy to do it. And so it's not about, um, you know, just <laughs> it, it's always based in truth and in, and respect and integrity. It's um, never just fluff, you know, it's never just like, oh, you're so amazing. You know, there's a really beautiful, genuine relationship that we have formed with the kids in our community, um, Australia-wide. Um, yeah, and, yeah, it's it's always given so much to us in return as well. But I do think that it is um, foundational work. And I also think that, um, you know, there's a lot of value in community. So parents are busy, you know, they're time poor, everyone's doing their best. Um, they that they can at any given point in time and I think it's really important for kids to have other grown-ups in their community who spend time with them that build them up that explore with them you know so whether it's aunties or uncles or friends or you know whoever godparents earth parents whatever you know your community is I think that's a responsibility that we all have as grown-ups for mm -hmm. the young people that are in our circles and that we can't just um you know, leave it all to the parents by themselves. Tell us about your community work, because you mentioned just off off uh, off air there before um, some of your travels, and and tell me about you know maybe some of your indigenous indigenous work in, in your community communities. Yeah, so um, I when I went to uni, I did psychology and indigenous studies, and I've always been um, 
you know, I understand that I'm a white person in this country and, and that we, um, wherever we are, uh, we're on someone's land, someone's country, and that there are stories and knowledges that have been here for millennia. Um, and I always carry that in my heart and, and try to be a deep listener and, and try to be a good ally. And that takes ongoing work and ongoing deep listening. Um, and so we had some really awesome opportunities through Dirt Girl, actually, because, uh, you know, we've never sold merchandise that could end up in landfill. We always um, oh, <laughs> worked. Right. Yeah, our model was around education and that's the wisdom of Kate and Huey again. But um, so we have done a lot of work with waste management, even with biosecurity. So I've spent um, a good chunk of the last two years traveling around the top end of Australia. So from Bardi Jawi country in far north WA to Larrakee country outside of Darwin and Cape York and a lot of time in the Torres Strait as well, which is incredible. Um, and yeah, getting to hear how traditional owners care for country and the work that Indigenous rangers do every day and how they use cutting edge technology with um, knowledge that their family have passed on for so long um, to work with biosecurity officers and that protects agriculture and food production all around Australia and there's these amazing good stories that we never hear about in mainstream media so to get to go and elevate those stories and share what these traditional owners wanted to share um, was just incredible. It's priceless information um, isn't it that, you know the the, I guess essentially the farming techniques, you know, for yeah. example, of, of, of Aboriginals. And, you know, um, uh, we had Shane Mortimer here yesterday yeah. telling us about that. Bruce Shane's Pascoe incredible. has written um, uh, Dark Emu. Uh, for anyone who hasn't read it, it's it's an amazing read. And essentially Bruce identifies through um, his observations and study and, and the, the journals of the early explorers mm. the um, that Aboriginals were essentially the first farmers in the world, you know, yeah. they, they farmed yam and, 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 and grains and rice and they used to smoke eels in the hollows of trees and fish. Um, very, very, um, you know, with these lazy techniques that the, 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 the other, you know, the, the um, Europeans just say they're lazy, lazy people, but they had these amazing techniques where they'd use a, a sort of a sappy um, uh, branch and they'd hook up a little, you know, a bit of twine as it was and, and um, catch fish by just sitting there watching it and the fish would get caught in this little twine and get flicked out onto the bank. And there was just amazing stuff and there's so much, such a rich history that I think we, we um, you know, it's, you're here to talk about regenerative agriculture or one of the things and, you know, that's a, that's a big, for me, it's a big layer of, of, of knowledge that I think yeah. we really need to tap in and in integrate. Well, to me, regen ag, you know, a big principle in that is learning to listen to the land and respecting the power of biodiversity and of systems and that the wisdom that nature has, you know. And I think that's a through line there. And I think another through line is that we get that at the system that's at play in the world at the moment isn't necessarily um, helping us be more resilient or safer for the future. And moving forward, we really need to make sure that there's not um, a dominance of nature or a dominance of each other, that we have um, a diversity of perspectives that are informing how we move forward. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. I keep coming back to that idea of biodiversity. And I think even human groups are stronger thanks to biodiversity, mm. just like nature and, and ecosystems. And I guess the diversity of, of thinking, diversity of principles, um, you know, that, that we need as a, let's just you know, call it the, co co the collective of regenerative practices, you know, we, we're not about, well, I'm certainly not about saying you, you know, people should be all doing this or mm. doing that. It's about, well, you've got to work out, you know, what form of mimicking nature w w suits, suits your, la your, your, your business and your mm -hmm. landscape, you know, what practices can you afford? What, what fits in your current farming practices? So, I mean, big fan of, of diversity of thought. Yeah, you know, diversity I of people because there are such amazing even here yesterday you know the the, mm. the the number of different people we had there in the room I would like to see more doctors mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I wish uh, it'd be nice to see more bankers there as well because <laughs> you know they're they're important they're sort of sort of at the either end of the spectrum well they're actually all through it there you know bankers are providing money to farmers and the doctors are you know trying to treat people who got who get sick because they're 
not maybe eating the right sort of food. You know, mm. there's, there's interesting dynamics there. But That's a, a can of worms there. Should we open it? <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> can of worms. <laughs> I don't know. That's uh, we might have. Well, we can chat about that. Let's let's go there a little. It's on the okay. food, the foodie bit. It's a bit we political. Have, we don't have to bag anyone because this is. I have to say, this is um, this this podcast series is um, is is very um, gratefully supported by Landcare Australia. So I'm conscious that um, yeah, we love them. We love Landcare. Um, I'm making a heart with my hands yeah. <laughs> for the people who are listening <laughs> the to the hand. podcast, not watching right, the video right on, on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, a bit, uh, yeah. If, if you're not watching on YouTube, then then you, you're missing the the beauty of the garden we're sitting here in at Jilamatong. Um, so, but we know we don't have to sort of tread on too many toes. We can we can. I, th- I think it's an important conversation because you know we're all, as I say at the beginning of conferences, you know, put your hand up if you eat food. Yeah. It's like you know we we all we all we all rely on food to 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 live, and it's our choices to whether we eat food that that makes us healthier or we eat food that 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 actually essentially um can um produce disease you know yeah. it's 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 a it's a simple equation i think so yeah. um and you know our engagement with food is political and it's also not so we have a system that makes it difficult often for people um to be able to afford nutrient rich uh food that hasn't been produced with sprays and chemicals um you know so there's there is a system at play there that can disadvantage people from engaging with that depending on how much money you earn a week or, you know, all kinds of things. And also access to information and Mm. education. You know, the things that we learn about, I was in a um, a grocery store a while ago and I heard um, a little girl and her mum in the fresh food section and uh, the little girl said... I shouldn't buy this, should I, mummy? It'll make me fat. Mm. And it just really struck me because rather than talking about nutrition uh, or nourishment, that conversation was about deprivation and about worry and fear, you know, of, mm. of, of being overweight and labels, you know. And I just thought at so early on we're kind of having the wrong conversations around what food offers us. And, you know, I... I haven't really talked about this before, but um, when I was 16, after my mum died, I had anorexia and I went through a period where I deprived myself of nutrients and nourishment. And now I'm the biggest foodie. I love food and I love food that I can feel is nourishing me. And I love making food from the people that I hold close to me and knowing that I'm giving them nutrients and I'm loving them up by what I'm giving them on their plate and then I'm loving the planet and the community around me by where I choose to purchase and how I engage with our local food producers um, and even by choosing to buy locally, you know. It's it's a big part of my heart now. It's just, I mean, for me, food is... It's it's the commonality again. We all eat food, but it's a common thread. You know, farmers are producing it. You know, the feeders, the eaters, they're eating it. Um, they, it goes through a few sets of hands, generally in the middle. I'd like to see less sets, to be honest. Um, people buying more directly would be great. But that's the connection that we we as eaters, you know, let's say urban people who aren't on farm, can have with their farmer. You know, and they yeah. can they can actually eat eat that food. Um, Hopefully, knowing where it's from and how it was produced and why it was produced and why that pra- that farmer was using those particular practices and yeah. how they're you know hopefully good practices that have produced a nutrient dense um, food that they're that they're eating and and I'm a you know a big fan of the idea and, and we practice this and and we we support others who do of having reverence for food yeah you know, absolutely it's just sort of really savoring the taste understanding its origins and you know. Being grateful for yes, it's a word that is you know used everywhere, but it's it is because it's it's an important word that you know we sort of we've forgotten about generally. But being grateful for the fact that that is nourishing us, yeah, you know, and and it's and it's the quality of the food, um, which you know farmers are are um I think coming around to understanding that, that you know the, the farming practices that produce quality. Food. That's where this. That's where the. That's where the eaters are going. You know that they're they're not so worried about the quantity. You know, farmers and I was a commodity farmer. We're producing a quantity of food, and it was about yield. 
and yeah. quality wasn't the thing. But if we, but you know, and, and we live in a and we live in a supply based economy in agriculture, at least in Australia, where a lot of food is produced before we know where it's going to go. Yeah, and we're just supplying it. And and the wonderful thing about people understanding where their food's from is that they're creating a demand for that food, and that's a really healthy foundation for an economy. Yeah, you know, not just for agriculture, but for the whole nation. You know, whether it's technology demand or food demand or whatever else. You know, that's a healthy way to have it. So um, it's so interconnected to you know you're talking about it that previously it was based around commodity mm. that puts um, a real rush on the duration of production too, you know. Pump it out. Yeah, pump it out. And that's sort of what we've been talking about as well is that there needs to be a shift in that expectation as well. And, you know, the nutrients that your food can absorb as well while it's in, you know, longer in the ground in nutrient-rich soil. And then that goes into our belly and we have all these beautiful, this beautiful microbiome mm. being cultivated and, and we're learning all about the um, brain-gut highway, you mm. know, and how that affects not just our physical health but our mental health, which, again, are interconnected. This this big uh, learning process that we're going on about this, you know, cycle of nutrients, and and that really um, pump it out, pump it out way of producing food also then leads to huge waste. Yeah. You know, um, I've been to the National Waste Conference the last three years, and you know, talk uh, spoken to people like Ronnie from Oz Harvest, who's incredible, and um, and even with Kate and Costa, we have done a lot of work around compost. And if you're creating food that is taking out beautiful nutrients out of soil that's healthy, um, then you eat it; it goes into your stomach. You use the food scraps to create more soil to grow more food that has the nutrients in it. You know, it's the power of the nutrient cycle, and and it really does all start in the soil and our respect for the soil. It's a great point because you know the the if we're growing nutrient dense food, then we've got um, uh, the scraps of that nutrient dense food when they go into compost, are going to produce a much better compost. Yeah, know? oh, like, absolutely. Like the dead, and you hear stories about, you know, people throwing, I'm not going to mention names, but branded, you know, cereals over the fence of their chickens and they won't touch them <laughs> because they're just dead food. That's when you've got to worry about That's what you're That's what you're worried about. And, the, you know, the flies <laughs> won't even go on some, you know, packet food and things. Yeah, so, well, because um, maybe food is a bit of an overly <laughs> generous label for it. <laughs> it's, what is it? It's filler sometimes. Um where are we going to go now, Marie? What would you? Oh no, I know you. 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 Being you, being you, you're always sort of um, not so much on to the next thing, but you're always thinking ahead, and you're always, you know, um, I guess educating yourself. What? 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 What's the next little chapter of education or development or study? Yeah. You want to? Well, last year in the middle of the year, um, I spent about a month doing this sort of personal odyssey of learning. I was trying to work out where I took what I do next. So I've, you know, I've spent 10 years in film and TV, also in environmental education. I've got to travel around to so many incredible communities around Australia. And then I've also got this background in mental health, you know, and that's a big focus as well for people at the moment because a lot of people are having reckonings about the reality of our times and it's confronting and intense and confusing. So I wanted to work out how I combine and kind of hybridize these different experiences that I've had and interests that I have. And at first I thought maybe I would work with climate refugees, which doesn't necessarily mean just people who have emigrated from different sovereign states. We have climate refugees already in Australia. Mm. Um, yeah. And so I looked at that. And then what I realized is, is that I, that is incredibly important work but I would actually really like to come into the the picture of the story a little bit earlier and work with communities to help them build resilience mm. for the future. Um, and and the, the thing that I've learned, so I'm doing my master's now, my master's in disaster resilience and sustainable development. It's through wow, the UN. That's cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, cool as in that's, that's, that's a worthy, worthy use of your time, that's for sure. Well, it is cool as well because it actually makes my heart feel a little calmer because for me it feels like I'm going to a, 
the sort of crux of some of the work that needs to be done. There's so much work that needs to be done and it's all valid. Um, but for me, it's looking at the systems that are in place and why they're not serving us and how they're not creating a resilient, uh, regenerative future for for um, people, for planet, for um, creatures and and where the opportunities for change are. So transitioning sectors, building local capacities in communities. Um, so it's very much about the the window for change mm. and how we how we can shift and how we can do better for each other and the planet. And that is inherently hopeful. John, talking about I guess uh, opportunities, we've we've um, the nation and, uh, and certainly in the western part of the. Australia they, they had their fair share of fires as well over the summer in January, mm. and an enormous amount here in the eastern side of the of the country. Um, what opportunity do you think that's sort of presented to to the nation, to farmers, to politicians, to you know different stakeholders um, that that are related to the fires? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's interesting because. We're sitting here now and there isn't fire burning on this property, mm. but it's still not necessarily a past reality, you know, yes. what's done to the land here and what communities have to deal with is ongoing. Um, so, you know, I said that this course, for example, that I'm doing is inherently hopeful. It also very much goes into the reality of our times. And one thing that I w would really love to say that I'm not hearing spoken about I don't feel enough in the media at the moment is that we talk about natural disasters, but in the area of disaster risk reduction, um, natural phenomena are not disasters until they overwhelm the local capacities, mm. until they overwhelm the capacities of a local system. That tends to be based around human life and human systems. I personally... Um, you know, am concerned and invested in the well-being of ecosystems mm. uh, and that includes humans. We're part of nature and we need our natural resources to be healthy and regenerative. regenerative. Um, but essentially this idea that a natural phenomenon isn't inherently disastrous. Where that is tricky is the fires that we've seen recent, recently here in Australia are truly unprecedented mm. in their intensity and their scope um, and so many people who were involved in those said we just haven't seen anything like it um, mm. they were so unpredictable they were so hot you know and that we spoke about that here yesterday I think there's a few opportunities out of that first of all I think a lot of Australians we live f fairly isolated from the rest of the world. You know, we don't have a lot of, we don't have other countries bordering us, you know, in terms of sovereign states, uh, land to land. And so we kind of have our world that we live in here and mainstream Australian society is fairly fortunate. You know, we mm. call ourselves the lucky country. Mm. And what those fires did, particularly on the back of such a long drought. So before there were the fires, there was the dry and there is still the dry. We've seen some rain. It's not enough in a lot of areas to actually change what's going on. But but what it's done is it's it's literally brought it home. You know, for Aussies, even people living in Sydney, that idea of a drying and warming climate and the outcomes of that, it wasn't academic anymore. It wasn't something that you hear about and you can either believe the science or not believe the science. When it's in your community, when it's in your faith, face, in your lungs, lungs yeah. you know, you can't ignore it anymore. Mm. And, and that's intense for people because um, it becomes real and then they have to work out how they feel about that and, and what are they going to do about it. Do you think, um, I and mean, what would you suggest people sort of do about it? Is there is there some, I mean, I'm not just talking about sort of in response to fires, but is there sort of some actions that you, um, you know, simple or otherwise that that people can, um, can 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 engage with? Mm. You know, that can can because I my sense is that, um, you know, people they're hearing doom and gloom, and they I think everyone's pretty clear, or at least they they they've been hearing that things aren't so good. Yeah. Um, and from an environmental, from you know, point of view, the nation, the, the globe, um, there's lots we can be doing. Um, but I don't know that people know what they can do. There's there's a fear. It's sort of currently like a fear based sort of 
um, point of view at the moment? And what 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 could you suggest pe- some people can do to to make a difference to contribute? Well, I think we kind of need to look at a few different communities in Australia. So. First of all, we need more adequate leadership on a governmental mm. level. Um, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of information out there and recommendations within the d- disaster risk reduction industry about how we can be building resilience um, and what we need to be doing. And the truth is, you know, I just wrote five thousand words on that to do with fire, and then I go and look. Um, <laughs> at the news and our government has announced something that's completely the opposite direction despite all the information they have available to them. And I think that's also confusing for people because they're starting to understand the reality and our government isn't matching that with the information that they're putting out there. There's a lot of denial and policies aren't shifting and that confuses people um, and it also builds fear further, I think. And it also can make people question what's the point of them doing things in their day-to-day lives mm. when the system is still going in the opposite direction. And and I get that. We have a sense of urgency around um, what's happening and, and it is it is valid, definitely. Um can but we need to find some we need to find some calm i think and and have a strategy but i do think we need leadership on a governmental level um insurance companies are already taking the advice of disaster risk um management uh you know um principles private sectors are shifting um really the 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 federal and state governments need to catch up with that and then on a personal level i think um, something that really helped me was there's a guy named Richard Lear. He spent a lot of time with First Nations people in the US and he talks about radical hope and the idea that the scope of what's possible at any one point in time or one point in history shifts. And when I work with people at the moment and talk to them about mental health and resilience through these uncertain times, I think it's understanding that um, the scope of what's possible has shifted. Um, even for parents, you know, in in our community, we're told that you the number one thing as a goal, um, the number one goal as a parent is to keep your kids safe and offer them the best future. Now, climate change and the climate crisis means what parents can promise their kids for the sh- future has shifted, mm. and that's confronting for a lot of parents. Um, but for me, hope isn't sort of some a huge, uh, you know, um, yeah, some huge thing. It's a connection to what's possible at mm. this point in time. And so I try to stay connected with what's possible. And if what's possible for you today is to do something in your world, that's great. If you can write to your MP, amazing. If you can tell your local member what matters to you and remember that they are, it's their job to represent the values of their community and you're one of their community members, keep talking to them. Um, that's really powerful. If you want to show up at a march and hold a sign and that's how you feel seen and heard and that's how you stay connected with what's possible, that's brilliant too. If you can grow your own food, I think that's pretty amazing. Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good point you make about sort of, you know, that that, that we can, um, it can be a big thing to tackle, you know, the, the, you know what, what are we protecting our children from, you know, you know climate crisis, the language around, um, you know, the, the, a changing climate. I think farmers are often... Um, not, well, I, mean, I guess some farmers are blamed, but also, you know, have, have been expected to shoulder the responsibility of that. So, um, and, and farmers, it's a big thing for people to get their head around, let alone farmers who are sort of at the coal face, yeah. where, you know, we're expected in some ways to save the planet. And look, I think we've got the tools to do it. However, you know, I, I like to try and simplify it a bit and say, look, you know what? Yes, there's some expectation around us saving the planet. We'll, we'll do it. It'll be right. We've got the tools. Um but you know, for farmers to get their head around that, it's a big, it's a big ask. So I always say, you know what? You've got five acres, you've got fifty thousand acres, whatever you've got. That's your world that you need to focus on. You know, yeah. and and focus on what's in your control, and you know, and, and you know, 
changing practice, changing the paddock between your ears before you change what's <laughs> going on got in the, you know, out in your paddock. And I've been thinking about it recently. It's also about changing the paddock within your chest, you know, that your heart and actually you know, aligning your your new paradigms, um, hopefully some new paradigms, if a farmer wants to change what they're currently doing, and I think a lot of do right now, um, aligning your your um your sort of your mental, your logical um, paradigms or new ones perhaps with your with your heart paradigms, you know, and, and your values essentially. Because as a farmer 15 years ago, I didn't know, no one had ever asked me to write a list of my values. Yeah. I had them and I sort of used them as a bit of a filter, but it was very unconscious or, you know, and I, and I wasn't living my values basically. Yeah. So I think um, just putting all that into the farming context, you know, asking farmers or, or, or supporting farmers to look after their patch, you know, it's yeah. not being selfish. It's just like, let's just do this in, in manageable chunks, yeah. you know, and sort of, you know, the, whether it's using biodynamics or natural sequence farming or it's just composting your, your food scraps. I think yeah. there's, there's a great deal we can do that's manageable within our control to focus on. Um, and for me, that's one of the mantras of regenerative agriculture is just focus on what you're in control of, yeah. what you can control, you know, because yeah. we do a lot of – and I guess – maybe a similar message for um you know people living in the city where they might feel like they can't they can't do anything and everything's out of control but you know there's, there's, as you said there's there's um growing your own food you know yeah. joining a local gardening group um i'm a big fan of of of, of cranking up um land care groups in urban areas and, yeah. and, and and even the idea of land like people from the city joining a country land care group you yeah. know borough have got this amazing 20 year old um project Called, called Building Bridges to Burrowa, and it's a it's a project that that um, uh, essentially um, a busload of people from North Sydney Bush Care with who are aligned with North Sydney Council come down for a weekend a year in September and they plant habitat trees for superb parrots. Oh, and they love beautiful. it. It's twenty years old. It's like an award winning program. They love it because they get to have a feed in a shearing shed that night, and you know the fire outside, and they go to the pub or whatever they do, and they camp. And, and you know it's such a wonderful thing. And it's just a, it's just one example. We've it's actually a blueprint for that. So anyone out there who's who wants to know about how to start their own little community relationship with a with a with a with a country town, we can give you that blueprint see that's awesome i love that i love that idea of you know it's an older concept but that idea of a sister town and totally. often in the past it was in different countries you know but having our rural and urban communities mm. become partners you know and sharing resources and sharing joy and sharing challenges so that our rural food producers and communities aren't um you know suffering in isolation and our urban communities um are staying engaged with um where their food comes from and you know the people who are at the core of our land um, you just spoke about something before and it, it made me think of um, a concept in psychology called psychological flexibility mm -hmm. and it's where you can understand um, the full reality of a situation but still move towards what matters to you and that's something that I really see that we all need to be working on together and to do that, one, I think we need to learn to listen to ourselves mm -hmm. again I think we have been cultured and conditioned for a long time, particularly in the Western world, to consume, you know, mm. that that's how we find joy or escape or relief, um, <coughs> among many other things. Mm. <coughs> that's mm. a big conversation that yeah, I can't, can't do justice right now. But we'll, one say, I, we'll save it for next time. You know, and, and those <laughs> principles of domination and depletion rather than building each other up and building ourselves up you know so I think learning to listen to ourselves is a big thing that moving forward will be um, really important and help us be more resilient for the future I also think that um, connection and purpose you know research and practice shows that that's a really strong protective factor in people who are vulnerable to mental health issues or you know to just struggling in general which we all do that staying connected to purpose and also community mm. are incredibly important things so and I actually spoke to Jack about this as well Jack Johnson when we were talking 
that's, John, John, that's, o, John Odo is mate. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a name. <laughs> John, I'm proud I got to hang out with him. Um, He's I, my next guest, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get out of the chair, Marie? <laughs> I've got a real guest coming. No, hang here. Um, no, <laughs> no, He's he, just going to sing me a song. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> Oh, I can sing you a song. I know. Yeah. You can, he can <laughs> play the guitar and you can sing. Um, no, but uh, we were talking about how you always just feel better when you when you get out your front door and connect with the people in your community. Like go and do something you love. Go to the beach or, you know, go and see your friends. It might not seem like you're doing anything for the planet, but by, by staying a connected community member, it is incredibly powerful. Mm. And... And in, you know, my master's when we're looking at all these disaster risk reduction policies and concepts and and how we can um, build resilience for the future and regional resilience, you think it might be all these really um, complex structural answers. But one of the things that we come back to all the time is local capacities. So knowing your neighbours' names, knowing what each other's strengths are. Like time banking totally rocks my world, this idea of... Time banking? Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, ra- so rather than um, exchanging money for a service, mm. going back to exchanging a service for a service mm-hmm. and, um, you know, bartering by... Um, it's not it's not just helping because it is a legitimate exchange of what one person can offer that maybe they another person can't do, but you have something else that you can... Exchange and and communities that do time banking um, have been shown to be to have above average resilience during times of disaster compared to neighbouring areas because they they know each other's capacities they know their neighbors names they know um does someone only have a landline or do they have a mobile if I go and knock on their door because there's a fire at the end of the road and they don't answer they actually might be in their shed or down in the paddock. You know, they don't just leave when they don't answer the front door. There's all these things that if we only connect online, we don't necessarily know about mm. each other. And and when the power goes out in times of crisis or a disaster, you know, what we call a natural disaster, um, we need to know how to talk to each other and how to help each other IRL in the real world. And it, it's 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 um it's not like a new concept, is it? Like, you know, we we grew up. You know, it, it takes a village to 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 raise a child, yeah. and you know the even over my um my short life life time, um because I'm very young, um you know I, I just it's interesting that the, the community dynamics how they can change. You know, in, yeah. in terms of um just relationship with community. You know, and and I know Burrawa where you know that the Burrawa community I got to say is amazing. You know, and and I so fond of it and you know being able to walk into any shop and know who's there and um and remember stories and i don't know it's just a really it, it's a it's a wonderful thing and i'm not and i suspect that you know for people living in the city then the, you know the the grocery store or that they have their same experiences the street they've grown up on and they lived in it's such a it's such an underrated valuable um part of our lives isn't it that yeah. the, the connection connection with others just getting back to the the, the land care sort of relationship thing. Yeah, so how about like, I mean, there's already there's already a relationship between Bondi and Byron, like Byrondi. They've already, they've already, <laughs> that's the that's new land care group, Byrondi <laughs> land care. Um, so there you go, hipsters and groovers, you can take that on board and start your own one. But yeah, like, um, I don't know, Cobar and Cabramatta. I yeah, know, that, know, that'd or, be or, cool. Or it doesn't have to be the two C's or the two D's or whatever. <laughs> you, you love alliteration. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Sucker I think for alliteration. <laughs> Can I just say, um, you know, you're a fairly accomplished uh, grazier and uh, regenerative um, agriculture champion, but the moment that I kind of had a fangirl thing was when I found out that you were a land care ambassador. I was like, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, big fan. I think I, I big think fan I of land am. care. Yeah, I think it's one of it's. A, it's like a lifetime, like not lifetime sentence. It's actually. I'm so. I'm really proud of it. I'm. I'm well. Sure I'm, pr- I'm proud of the fact that you know we 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 were, um, you know, our family joined the. I think it was actually Burra was the second land care group in Australia. You know, the wow. first one was in Victoria, and I think Burra was the second one. Oh, Burra was certainly in the first few months of of it being um, um, adopted in Australia, and and Bob Hawke was was one of the was well, he's at least the prime minister at the time that um, yeah right. that um, got that over the line, and um, uh, and so we've had a really proud history with land care, and there was and, and just on ground level, not just, but you know, on ground trees, fencing, gully erosion, salinity, all that sort of stuff. 
and then um, it's been a beautiful thing to maintain that and, and sort of work in different community groups and different regional groups and then state and 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 then now with Landcare Australia. So it's a it's a wonderful organisation, and I really strongly urge anyone a farmer. Um, you know, city, country, whoever, just think about it because it's a thirty-year-old, uh, more than now plus, um, institution that it's is it, that has ridden, it's ridden the changes of government, changes yeah. of policy and legislation, catastrophe, um, changes in the sort of the the the, the governance, and it's really um, incredible that it has. Um, yeah, so so look, I'm, that's I'm bang on about it, but it's it's such a it's it's such a it's a remarkable organisation. No, I think it's worth taking a moment to celebrate mm. the legacy mm. for sure. Um, so speaking of things that you've been doing, is this where, turning around? Is this kind turning of. Well, no, me, still, me. still making no, about me you, too. What are you doing? No. Well, we're kind of collaborating at the moment, aren't we? You and I. We have to say. Um, and it's to do with the health <laughs> of the soil. Totes. Um, which is part of why I'm here in this area in the first place. Um, so can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, we can. That's it. This is we're on. Just to remind everyone, we are on a farm, <laughs> and that is a little buggy that is being driven. I think, I'm not sure if it's taking food from the kitchen up to where um, there's a there's actually a um, a workshop being held here that is all about drought resilience and 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 being able resilient against a fire, um, bushfires, and hydrating the landscape. So you are hearing the drone of a <laughs> buggy taking. God knows what up to the tucker, uh, tucker <laughs> up to the shed, um, which is so interesting too because there's a lot of conversations happening at the moment around how we're going to deal with uh, the risks and outcomes of drought and the hazards of bushfire and how we can minimise vulnerability and build resilience. And they're looking at having a national emergency and fire summit, which is brilliant, mm. um, and including First Nation knowledge. Is, um, and talking to a, a really wide group of people from different sectors. Um, but I hadn't heard um, some of what uh, Martin was Martin. talking about yesterday with soil and mm. the answers that are in the soil, you know, and how we're holding water in the wrong places. And yeah. it was... Or, or, or not holding water at all. Yeah. And it was so yeah. fascinating, yeah. The, the relationship that... Uh, is possible between regenerative agriculture and fire resilience, and that's something that I really hope um, makes its way into into the troubleshooting that's going to be happening. You know, mainstream. Yeah, uh, there has been hints of support from government, um, and there's Maloon Creek Institute has certainly um, been the recipient of funds to help roll out some training on on that, which is fantastic. I'd love to learn. So more. we have to thank the government for that for for supporting that initiative. Um, because the more I understand it, the more I see it, and we're looking at it right now. Um, the more I appreciate that you know the hydrology or the lack of mm. a functioning hydrological cycle in our landscape, and this is global, not just Australia or here at Braidwood, is the most important thing. You know, like the the it's the it's the vital ingredient. Yes, we need solar, and yes, we need the bi biology and everything, but it's that magic ingredient of it's it is the bringer of life, you know, mm. and and when you can retain the the water that falls where it lands in the landscape, because in the last two hundred and thirty years we have created the most effective drainage system across this continent. That's why it's you know, that's the one of the one of the I, I believe one of the contributing factors of the bushfires. It's a contributing factor to drought. People might say oh, it's a it's a changing climate and and it doesn't rain as much. I, we've got a, we've got a, we don't necessarily have a rainfall problem. We've got a rain retention problem because mm, mm. we're just and, going. And sometimes we have both. Yeah, look, you know, uh, it's the often variation, not one or the other. Yeah, but, yeah. but both at play, and when they combine, they really do make us more vulnerable to those hazards that are occurring. It's a horror story, isn't it? Yeah. Now we were going to talk about. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you go. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> so we've you're far more articulate <laughs> no no i was just it's funny i was thinking about it i was thinking that we've dragged you into it but not really it sort of started in a kind of true it, regen it, spirit it wasn't really that hard a you just said do you want to do this yeah <laughs> oh, what all right you're do? a co-producer now <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> What? <laughs> what? I'm, I, I gotta like make the make the coffee or something. What's going on here? <laughs> so we're working on an impact production mm. that has three stages, and the first stage is um, creating some factual content, 
documentary style um, around the major challenges that we're facing in this country for food production, food security and the nutrient cycle and how a lot of that starts and ends in what's beneath our feet and what we can't see, our soil. So that's really exciting. So you, Charlie Arnott, are on board (laughs) and our co-producer Sue Bradley Mm -hmm. and myself and we've got some exciting hosts that have come on board who mm-hmm. are going to travel around Australia and find some solutions together. Yes. And what are we doing on Tuesday? We are. We're doing a little, um, we're doing, taking some video, some footage, a little bit of a teaser, putting mm. a teaser together. Can we say where? Uh, in a, well, in one, a, one of the spots you can talk about, yeah. Oh, okay. The yeah. one the one that's um, at Byron Bay. Yeah. As in... The one that we know we, we we met at. Well, yeah, we did. Yeah, okay. when we say the farm, actually, no, we met before that. Did we? Yeah, we oh, met we at met Pocket at, City Farms. Oh, farm. I yeah. harassed you. You and you and Costa, Costa and having I were dinner. On a panel. I said, you know what? I'm a bit of a fanboy, and I wanted to say hello. And oh <laughs> yeah, my god, yeah, you came and got a selfie. It was I great. I did. I did. <laughs> what a what a knob. But anyway, oh. no, it was. <laughs> but it was fun. No, I'm glad. I'm glad so I did. Not true. It was I so pushed, nice. I pushed through my my um. Anxiety well, around like I all said, that. We love what you do too. That's well, why no, we're working together. Well, here we are. Here we are. Yeah, so, exactly. um, no regrets at all. No. So, yes, the farm at Byron Bay, which yeah. is an amazing 80 acres of um, mixed, mixed agriculture essentially, and yeah. and it's a great model that, that we hope that gets rolled out elsewhere and it can be um, literally modelled by that that um, uh, by by the lanes. Tom and Emma, who who had the the vision to to put this all together. Um, 80 acres. They've got cattle. They've got they've got um, pigs, chickens. There's a number of hectares of uh, acres there, with, and then about five or six other farmers who are actually um, tenants, and they're growing fruit, uh, vegetables mainly. Um, and all of that produce, and the eggs, and the pork, and the beef go through the restaurant, and the, the tenants yeah. who are looking after the restaurant are um, three blue uh, three ducks. ducks. And you know what? I, I can't believe you're not going to believe this. I was driving through Braidwood today. And who did I see on the side of the road and pull up? Darren. No. No way. Oh, and Mags. Meant to be. It was unreal. <laughs> I just went, I went, no, that can't be. He's like, no way. Because yeah. um, we can say, so Clayton Donovan, we're very excited mm. to have come on board as our third host. So it will mm. be you, Charlie Arnott, me, Marie Lose, and, and Clayton Donovan. Cool. And he's a, a good friend of Darren as well. Yeah. At Three Blue Ducks. So he's excited. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to uh, nestle our way into the kitchen for a bit, I think, as well there. Totally, we are. Yeah, so we're going to, because a beautiful um, uh, um, little farm there. There's a macadamia orchard. Um, we've got the we've got the fr- they got the vegetables. Um, a bakery yeah. there. Um, a bread social. The guys there, Sam and, and the boys. Um, they have a florist as well. Florist, absolutely. So um, Jordan and um, we, we, it's just such a wonderful collective of like-minded people. And that's the model, you know. That's yeah. the model, and th- and and that's a, a retail sort of thing. I'd love to see more farms. Um, uh, reflecting those sort of that sort of thinking, you know, it's collaborative. We'd love to actually. This is I'm not sure when this is going to be put out, but we're looking for someone to look after our pigs. Are you? at Hannah Minow? Yeah, I should actually pump that out a bit earlier, like today on socials. Um, yeah, so we've got some amazing pigs, um, and they um, they all have names and they're beautiful. And we're going. We're looking for someone to actually work with us and profit share and and maybe live on farm if we can work that or or not just locally or work something out, and um, look after them for us and yeah. with us, you know. And so and we'd love someone to put some eggs on too, some oh, some chickens cool. like like big, you know, pastured. Um, Chicken caravan type stuff. So yeah, right. um, that's a that's the model. I'm, I'm I'd love to see you know everywhere. That'd yeah. be that'd be a game changer. And that's the thing. They're the kind of ideas we're wanting to hear and explore with this uh, with this impact production. So we're going to be speaking to Cindy O'Meara. Uh, She's great. Yeah, and Yo Spacker in mm. March, and Zach Wush. All these people who mm. are really looking at the nutrient cycle and the ro- role that soil plays in our human health and the role that food production plays and and how cyclical it all truly is and they're all incredibly innovative thinkers but um throwing something back a bit Mm. i had something i'd never really thought about um you were mentioning someone to look after your pigs Mm. so um do you want the the gig (laughs) i actually (laughs) would if i had capacity i'm like oh yes well i was thinking that i so i said i grew up in um the country um, in Grafton and Yamba, but my grandpa, he had a farm um, in Federal 
Absolutely wow. stunning place. Yeah. But he was a pig farmer. Wow. And so I grew Good up going up on there. his tractor, you know. But he, mm. I'm going to be really honest, he was not, he didn't have regenerative practices. Not not explicitly. He was mm. a pretty mm. standard pig farmer. Yeah. Yeah, so. And, and uh, how long ago was that? Like, did we talking, you know, how many years ago was, that, was, uh, that, was he operating up there? Yeah, I think until kind of the... Late nineties, mm. yeah. Late nineties, okay. we were still going up to the farm and putting our gum boots on and yeah, it, hanging out with the pigs and the veggies. And it is an amazing part of the world up there because um, they can grow anything. You know, they oh. did have a dry. They had a dry. They, they had a few months of dryness there um, at the end of last year and early this, and then when it rained, everything just absolutely exploded. Again. It is it just so shows fertile. How, it's amazing. <laughs> it's it's incredible. Babies just popping out of the ground up there. <laughs> it's, it is incredible. So we're big fans of um, uh, what's happening up there. Any more on the on the, the secret squirrel project? Anything else? <laughs> so farm the farm. We're doing some stuff there with those guys. Yeah, um, anyone yeah. else we need to plug up at the at the farm? Um, I think I think that's it. I think we've got a really exciting team on board, which is really, yeah. I can't wait to to get to Tuesday actually. Um, That'll be fun. Yeah, and then March is going to be really fun as well, and we'll see what comes out of that. But um, I think if anyone has any stories about um people who are doing good stuff in their community and uh, doing anything interesting around regen farming, food production, the nutrient cycle, they could get in touch with you or me because we really want to hear about what everyone's doing and all the good stories. Um, Yeah. And, and be able to celebrate, celebrate and share them. Celebrate. 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 No, I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think, um, and, and just on that, we, we've just, we had, um, dinner last night with some of the people who are at the conference, um, at Jilamatong yesterday. Um, we, uh, sorry, at Maloon Creek and then we hit Jilamatong and, and we've met some wonderful people. Yeah. And the the one thing that I, I love about this space, um, well, not just not just this geographic space, but the the, the, the regenerative farming, and I know that's sort of a, a term that's being used a lot. But I'm, unless someone can come up with a sort of a more succinct one, I'll, I'll use that collective term. Um, the people involved are just really wonderful people. Oh, good people, I know, and that's what I mean. Your heart just that's not to say the good. others aren't that aren't doing it. I'm just no, saying as, no, as a collective, no. we've got a, sort of a. You know, they've no. got the they've got the paddock in the between the ears and in 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 the rib cage sort of. Pretty clear what they what they're doing and why. Yeah, absolutely. I think people are connected with their values. I'm not saying they're correct above other other values, you know. Mm. But people are very in this community are very connected with their values. They're definitely living their values, which yeah. I think um, there's an exuberance to people who are living their values. Yeah. You know, it's attractive and it um, is inspirational and aspirational. Um, there's an incredible generosity of sharing knowledge and skills, you know, that people in this community understand the strength strength of the collective mm. and collaboration, or as my friend Sarah says, co-liberation. Co-liberation. Yeah, I, I love that. Down. That's ice. Yeah. Charlie's making notes. This is great. <laughs> yep. They will be, uh, they'll probably, some of them will be in the show notes because we're so... So we're so professional in what we're doing. <laughs> show notes. Yeah, you have this um, spiffy new sound set up that I was it's really impressed so good, with. so good, isn't it? Yeah. I'm, I'm a, like a tech, You're a real podcaster now. Oh, look out, Tim Ferriss. And then <laughs> he's about to fall. <laughs> Having <laughs> said that, we have two microphones here set up and they are Rode microphones, so they are legit. But one, Charlie's microphone is affixed to the table with a bone that we found on the ground and the other is affixed to the table with a stick. Sorry, Sticks now. and bones are... Yes, Still won't holding break us up. my bones. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the thing about this community that I love is how generous it is and how collaborative it is. And again, it's that um, appreciation of biodiversity, of opinions, of people's stories and hearts and nature. And it's all that cycle. Well, you know what? That cycle is, I think, where we're going to have to finish it because, well, no, we won't finish it. This is just going to, we should have a break. Oh, okay. Well, not from this podcast because I'll get you back for sure. This is cool. this is so fun. Um, and you know the, the what I'm loving is doing. I, I'm not going to be able to do something inside now because we literally have chickens under the yeah. table <laughs> just stolen some bread from Sue over there. <laughs> <laughs> the girls are, are are at our feet. I know. I wanted to say hello before. <laughs> I could hear them in the background going. <laughs> I know. I love them. It makes me so happy. We had chickens when I was little. Um. 
And I really, yeah. They're so cool. <laughs> I love them. They're the best. Sue so yesterday was talking about how she wants chickens and she used the words pets and we, word pets and we were thinking about it and it's more like co-cultivators. Totally. Really? Yeah, These they are. Girls. They are. They, they're like, um, they're, they're really clever because they've got the three implements in one. They're a, they're a, um, they're a, they're a slasher with, yep. their, with their beaks and they're a plough with their feet and they're a fertiliser spreader at the back. Well, yeah, they recycle our scraps into... Totally. More yeah. nutrients. So, yes, they do. They're a very effective turner of turner of food. Um, and there was something else about them. Love their bum nuts. They're good. <laughs> we love them. And and they're just so cool. My my little boy calls them tukatuks. Oh, you know, like, that's so cute. Tuk-a-tuk, tuk-a-tuk. We were we were talking last night. Um, Helen McCosker and I, who's a, an incredibly valuable community member. Totally. Yeah. Carbonate. Yep, carbonate. Yeah. Give that a plug. National Regenerative Agriculture Day. Yep. Um, every Valentine's Day, um, farmers and foodies um, hijacking um, Valentine's Day. Writing basically. a love letter to the planet. That's which it. Which they do every day. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but celebrating on Febru- February 14th. Yeah. But yeah, Helen and I were talking about how chickens are a viral hit, you know, when you have online communities that you um, engage with. If you put chickens in the mix, tell you what, it. everyone wants to sh- share their chickens. Because Kelly, Kelly there at... Um, uh, Kelly Jones, at uh, who, who's who's an amazing graphic artist, who was has been helping Mike and Helen McCosker there with National Regenerative Agriculture Day. Mm-hmm. The the posters she's done are unbelievable, oh, and if you want to, so, so go to Facebook um, National Regenerative Agriculture Day. Actually, NRAD. Yeah, NRAD. Yeah. and you'll find the resources little button there, um, and you can um, you can I guess print them and and put them on your own socials and all sort of stuff yeah. they are so incredible and kelly you're a star um and those guys are doing such wonderful things we could just love you work, lots, kelly. Of, lots of plugs couldn't we? Who well, else should we plug while i've we're got on a, a good little sort of a segue um if you do go to that facebook page or the website mm. the nrad website and you see an event near you or one that you can get to that's to do with Regen Ag, even if you feel like it's not, you know, your space or you don't have a farm or whatever, I so recommend people go along because when you're in this space, it feels good and if it resonates with you and it clicks, you know, I think it really does have the potential to fill people's hearts as well as to help us understand more about the health of soil and our health. So go along. Like, mm. go in person. It's compelling stuff, isn't it? Like, yeah. you can't, I was saying to someone last night, um, you can't, you can't unhear and you can't unsee. Like, or you can't, unfeel. I, I, like, you can't well, unfeel. No, that's it. It is, it's a vibe. It's a good old, it's just, <laughs> it's just a vibe. <laughs> We're old, quoting the, cl- the castle the now. The castle for those non-Australians <laughs> or those who haven't Go and Google it. It's not on Netflix, but it's somewhere. <laughs> the castle, it is a, an Australian classic. Yeah. Well, Marie Lowe's, you're an Australian classic. Aww, and I'm going thanks, to have Charlie. to, not wanting to, but it's going to sign off now. Yeah, and let's go have a cuppa. Cup of tea, I think. And um, uh, I have to say, I've got to get home because I'm going to give someone else a plug. Rachel Ward. Who we all know and love, a, a wonderful, um, strong female director and storyteller. Storyteller, in yes, history. totally. She is a legend, um, uh, and she is going to be. She's putting together something. Um, I'm not going to tell. Like, I don't know how much I can tell people, but no, she, that's her story. To that's tell. her story. Yeah, but but anyway, um, we caught up and we're going to catch up at Hannah Mino. Yeah. Um, at Burrowa this afternoon, and um, you know, again, back to that. This space is a vacuum and some amazing wonderful people are being drawn to it and it's really exciting what what's happening in the world i think yeah and it's and it's a a solution i'm always a always talk about um you know people when there's a problem they go straight to solution and i say you know you got to look at the needs of the people involved because the problem is the result of an unmet need and um having said that though regenerative agriculture there are a lot of solutions there and a lot of need, people's needs can be met nutritionally, um, environmentally, ecologically, socially, culturally can be met in this wonderful space. So on that tyre pumping up note. <laughs> I love it. Love a good amp. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's been so fun. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It won't be right if we don't come back to Jilamatong to, do, it, to yeah. do the second one. Yeah, I would love that. I know I said to Sue before, I don't worry, I feel like I'm going to be back here. 
Totes, <laughs> we are so going to come back here. Yeah, and thank you, Martin, um, for having us here. It's Martin Royds. Look yeah. him up, Gillamatong, Facebook and um, Instagram, and doing amazing things with, the, with, with Peter Andrews, his mentor, um, rehydrating the landscape here at Braidwood, um, which used to be the food, food bowl of Australia for some time there. There's, there the wheat harvested mm. here at one point, has n- the, the, the yield has never been beaten. Yeah, in, in, in that's sense. impressive, isn't it? Totally. But what Martin's doing here and what the community are doing here is so impressive. It's an incredible model for anyone who is feeling like what they're doing on land isn't working mm. or how they're consuming food isn't really working for them. The principles. Tune into this. Yeah, absolutely. The principles apply. Cool. We'll do this all Thanks day. Thanks for having me. It's fun. Marie, you're a star. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, there you go. What a wonderful interview um, and, and what an opportunity to to chat with um, a true uh, storyteller and uh, and Marie's got a massive uh, future in front of her um, uh, and as a, what a wonderful history as well, you know, not just with adults but with, with, with children and, um, you know, her, her storytelling abilities and, and, the, and her work in that field has, um, is testament to that. Um, I'm lucky, to, uh, well, <laughs> I am lucky to say I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, I'm very excited about working with Marie in the future on a six-part docuseries that, uh, yeah, we're working on is in, in progress at the moment and um, very excited, but we'll tell you more about that as things proceed. Look, that's the end of the end of the series, really. That's, that's episode nine. We've had um, really overwhelming interest um, and and um, positive vibes about the whole the whole show. Um, it's a bit sad to see it um, end. However, um, I'd like to say we are going to do a series two and welcome your suggestions of who you'd like to see or hear interviewed in series two um, would be most welcome. Um, before I bang on a bit more about that, I just want to make some, some well, some thank yous, some appreciation uh, comments about the team that's put this together. So Reese at um, at Jaeger Media has has pulled this together. Producer, you know, editor, the whole show, the the tech guy, um, got us out of trouble many a time when we thought we'd all gone to put. But um, he's a legend. Todd from Creation Theory as well, keeping a close eye on um, on the on the process and some management, and also um, uh, is putting together our website. So very excited about announcing that that will be. Um, complete uh, very soon. Fiona Turney, my um, still haven't worked out what we call Fiona. She's a legend, um, assistant, offsider, the glue that holds it all together. She is fantastic. So thank you, Fiona, and um, my family, of course, Angelica and Lordy and Lilla and Venus and Persia, just patient with me in the time I spend on this particular project, which they know is very um, dear to me and I'm very passionate about. So they're they're cutting me a heap of slack. So thank you, guys. Um, last but not least, Delancey Australia, uh, who have supported this project from day one and and, and before. Um, wonderful organisation, and um, just very grateful that they've been able to, you know, keep keep, <laughs> keep the wheels turning, and um, and we look forward to working with them in the future as well. Um, so, who's next in the in the episode? Well, that's probably as much up to you guys as, as, as anyone else. So I do have um, – we are going to expand the range of, in, of interviewees a little more. We're going to look at you know, into the sort of the, more the health and the um, well-being space um, and and we're doing that for the main reason or the, 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 the very good reason, I think, that it's all inclusive in the regenerative agriculture because the food we eat um, – you know, uh, what's been and what's beneath our feet is what is keeping us healthy and happy or will if we eat the right stuff and we do the right things. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're going to be speaking with chefs and doctors and and um, we're going to be speaking with all sorts of people, um, even, you know, investment. Uh, you know, there's, there is a lot of money coming into investment and, and opportunity in the regenerative agriculture space at the moment. So I'll talk to a few of the, few of the guys and girls who are in, uh, in that space as well. Natural capital, um, there's a myriad of things. And, in, and again, the interesting thing is these, all, these are all connected. And that's why I want to bring them all together into this podcast series. So we've got Matt Moran. He's going he's to um, very kindly um, do an interview uh, with me. Um, Zach Bush is lined up. Um, who else have we got? I'm just going to forget now. Um, uh, Dinah Rogers, a sustainable dish over there in the States. 
Um, who else do we, do we think of? I should have written myself a little list here, shouldn't I? Um, Craig uh, Herity at KPMG, when I talk sort of, I guess, agribusiness um, at some point as well. Um, Dr. Libby Weaver, she's going to be on. Um, look, I'm sorry if I've forgotten anyone else I've been speaking to in the last couple of weeks about doing one, but they're all there and I'm, I just can't tell you how excited I am. Oh, Nicole Masters as well, soil guru Nicole Masters. Um, as well, I'd like to Damo, Damon Gamo. I'd like to snag you for another one. That was very entertaining. Um, I've got a few other ones too, having taken on the, the suggestions of many people on the website, uh, on, on and on, on socials and so on. That um, will also speak with a few farmers that are just legends who are doing their stuff. You know, they're not necessarily telling everyone about it, but they're just doing a really good job and 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 are masters of the game. So we'll be hearing from a few of them as well because I think that's important to keep it, you know, at ground level and also to understand that, you know, just because you're not known or you're not telling necessarily a story, a story doesn't mean you're not doing wonderful things and creating wonderful standards for others to follow. Um, look, that's about it. Uh, another, you know, just big thank you to all you listeners, finally, for um, subscribing and sharing and commenting and being part of this. And, you know, this is for you and um, this is why, you know, it's, 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 it's due to the, I guess, the, the welcome we've received and the, the, um, the positive, positive feedback we're getting, feed forward, I like to call it, um, that, that this will... We'll roll, roll, we'll roll into a second series. So um, I trust that um, you've enjoyed it. Um, I certainly have, and um, I'm really looking forward to, to um, sitting down and getting close and digging deep into the wonderful world of regenerative agriculture um, in our second series. But until then, um, share, comment, subscribe, go nuts, um, screenshot all those crazy podcast pages, thingos, um, so many people are doing that and I can't tell you how thrilled I am. And one last thing too, which is really pr- probably a bit of a highlight really, is I'm getting messages from people who who are saying this has really, really inspired them. You know, it's breaking paradigms and that it's really making a difference. And this is what it's for. This is what this podcast is all about, to to inspire and to... And, and to, 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 to uh, to stimulate people into action, you know, whether it's starting a bit of a, a grazing group in their local town, whether it's sort of starting a bit of a food hub, whether it's just sharing with their parents, you know, or kids, um, anything that that is a, a couple more steps, you know, outside of putting your headphones on and listening to a couple of podcasts, and there are so many that you could be listening to. So the fact you've you've listening to ours is um is amazing. So this is this is encouraging, you know. This is this is it, it was clearly needed, and I'm I'm honoured to be honest to be one of them because there's many really amazing podcasters out there in this space, but to be one of them that that's, that's um, putting these stories in the airwaves, it's a, it's a it's a really it's a humbling humbling thing. Um, there you go. See you all in series two. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. And as the recipient of the Bob Hawke Landcare Award, Charlie would like to thank Landcare Australia for their support in the creation of this first series of The Regenerative Journey.